something that the multimillionaires, people worth 20, 30, 50, 100 million dollars, they have a greater concentration of their wealth in private equity and real estate than those that are the traditional kind of one to ten million dollar accredited investor. You're listening to Alternative Investor Mastermind, where we do a deep dive on alternative investment opportunities and the lifestyle it can create. Join Jack Krupe as he presents actionable tips and tricks in doing passive real estate away from mainstream strategies. Go beyond the usual fix and flips and try less explored yet rewarding investing ventures from multifamily properties, mobile homes to cryptocurrencies. Do not miss this opportunity to escape traditional assets and finally create wealth without Wall Street. Now your host, Jack. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Alternative Investor Mastermind. Uh, today's a team episode. We've got uh, Zach Gariza with me, and uh, we're going to talk some shop a little bit today. Uh, Zach, how you doing? Yeah, doing pretty well, Jack. Happy, Always happy to be on the show again. So uh, you know, you, you've had a lot of conversations with investors the last couple of weeks. What, what's at the top of your mind for, uh, for questions you've been receiving from, uh, from investors? Sure. Yeah. So really, I think the main question I'm having right now is around you know, investors who are coming into real estate, into syndications, and they're just a little bit uncertain about which direction to go when it comes to investing in a fund versus going direct into an individual project, uh, as an example. So I think that's the question I'm getting is investors learn to really navigate these changing, changing economic times that, uh, that we're seeing here in real estate. So what do you think about that as a topic for today? I think that's a great topic to discuss. And, uh, you know, we've obviously done done and do both. So I think uh, we can uh, provide a, a ton of content here. Sure. OK, so, uh, Jack, can you start and give us uh, and, and all the listeners a bit of a high level overview about uh, kind of the differences that you see right off the bat, 30,000 foot view of investing in a fund versus investing in a direct uh, investment syndication? Sure. So there, there's pros and cons for uh, for both. Uh, I'll start with an individual deal. Um, you know, if you're going to invest in a deal, you know, you're picking generally one property, one market, one operating partner slash sponsor slash uh, slash syndicator, which we we tend to use those terms uh, somewhat interchangeably. And uh, you know, the pros are you know you get to to really dive into that deal. Uh, assuming you understand it and understand how to underwrite and understand how to how to vet your your operating partner and uh, you know you you do you know should know what you're what you're getting into uh, the cons of an individual deal are that uh, you have concentration risk it's it's also one property um, you've got well, what we've seen a lot lately is even political risk uh, one of our markets the uh, the, the, the city and the county are just not enforcing their laws. They're not uh, moving evictions through the system uh, in a timely manner. Uh, they're, they're, even when the eviction is completed, they're not actually sending the sheriff to actually execute the warrants for months. So um, there, there's a lot of risks, uh, also natural disasters, hurricanes, floods. If you're only in right. one deal, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of overall risk. And then lastly, there's risk of timing. Uh, if you did your first deal, the end of 2021, right before rates went crazy, then, um, you know, that could be a, an economic risk a, as well. Um, on the fund side, the, uh, you know, the only downsides are they are in some cases starting as a blind pool where you don't know exactly what properties are going to be invested in. However, you know, funds that are open for a period of time, you often, you know, can see the initial investments already made. So you're not always going in completely blind, but you do, lose a little bit of control because you're relying on the fund manager to make those investment decisions on your behalf for the deployment of capital. So uh, some people do see that as a con. Um, others that uh, really are trusting that uh, that fund manager to invest for them, it's probably a pro because uh, you can, you know, you're expecting that the fund manager will do a better job uh, than you would. And also, you know, a fund manager is often just more connected has sees better deal flow is negotiating better terms than you would because they're they're deploying larger amounts of money so uh, I, I think those are the key uh, the key highlights yeah so Jack you mentioned that you know really for direct investment it makes sense if you have a specific thesis an individual market or asset class that you're very familiar with 
But one thing that you mentioned uh, that's pretty interesting is the idea of vetting everything that I just mentioned, as well as vetting the operator. So because here at JCAM, you know, we've invested in direct deals, we've done fund of funds. Can you talk a little bit about kind of the difference in your vetting process between each? What's it like to vet uh, a direct deal versus how have you chosen, you know, successful fund managers in the past? Sure. So, you know, the, the direct deal, uh, obviously, you know, the exact property. So, um, you know, there's a lot more ability to, uh, you know, to underwrite the property itself. And, um, you know, we work with, uh, you know, we've probably got 50 sponsors plus that we've had some contact with and close to 20 that we've invested with. So, um, you know, we, we, we do have a, a lot of sponsors that have, uh, you know, crossed our paths over the years and a number we've had a lot of success with. Um, but, you know, with the property itself, you can really, you know, dive into what the business plan is. And often it's the value add plan. So, you know, you could really, you know, really understand the, you know, the, the, the economics of the deal. Are they going to renovate units, raise rents? You can look at, you can visit the property itself. You can, um, visit the comparables. Um, you can look at their track record of, of other, other properties and, uh, talk to references too. Um, hardly any of our deals are, are people, um, actually, I can't think of a deal we've invested in where it was someone really just off the street. Uh, that just doesn't, doesn't really happen. Uh, it's, it's people I've, you know, invested with, uh, over a number of years, people we know from conferences, from masterminds, um, from, uh, industry events, from referrals, from other operators in, in some cases, because, um, real estate is a team sport. And, uh, you know, there are times, especially when, you know, you only get one or two deals a year where operators are part partner together and, uh, you know, co, co, co general partner in a deal. So sometimes it's two operators. We know both of them and they combine on a deal. So, um, the deal is obviously, um, you know, very much, uh, the, the main focus for, for individual direct deals. Uh, now funds, usually they're much more sophisticated, much more experienced, uh, already have uh, a tremendous track record and, uh, you know, a demonstrated, uh, just, uh, value and history of, of generating returns because we don't necessarily see the exact properties. But at the same time, I could point to a deal we did uh, last summer, uh, right when interest rates were going crazy. Uh, we had the opportunity to invest in a fund that had already been opened for a year and was just about to close. So um, they had already purchased um, hundreds of millions of properties. They bought them in 2021. They had fixed rate debt. And we were able to come in towards the end of a fund where we actually still got to underwrite the properties and review the properties. And uh, that was an amazing opportunity. Um, so I, I know for us, you know, we're, we're, we're generally a fund of individual deals where we're really able to dive in, but occasionally we will do a true fund of funds. And yes, the, the barrier is, is, you know, the bar is a lot higher. If we're going to invest in someone else's fund, it's usually for a very specific reason because it's really a best in class opportunity. Right. No, it makes a lot of sense. And it's good to have both options when you're looking to build a diversified portfolio, whether it be as a fund manager or just as a regular individual accredited investor. So, uh, Jack, with that in mind, can you talk a little bit about, um, I guess, how the diversified approach could work when it comes to really figuring out your real estate investment style, whether it be asset class, geography? Can you, can you talk a little bit about, you know, kind of Someone who's brand new, they know they want to invest in real estate. They don't want to be a landlord, uh, as an example. Maybe they've looked into REITs, um, but there's something about it that just doesn't feel right. Can you talk maybe a little bit about those differences and a little bit about kind of navigating your own style when it comes to real estate investing? Sure. Well, first things first, I, I don't like REITs at all for high net worth investors. If you have a high W-2 or high net worth and you're paying anywhere near the top tax bracket, REITs are just not tax efficient. Uh, everyone thinks that there's no taxes for REITs, and uh, that's true only at the entity level. The REIT itself doesn't pay taxes. But the catch is the distributions that are sent to you as an investor are taxed at ordinary income because there's uh, not a tax at the corporate level. So often you're paying as high as 29.6% tax on your dividends. Uh, versus syndications, private funds are generally completely tax deferred because you show a loss on paper through depreciation. So right off the bat, from a tax efficiency perspective, um, you know, REITs are, are definitely not, uh, not the optimal strategy. Now, for as far as crafting a portfolio, if you're just starting with a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars, 
you, you don't have enough money to really be diversified. Uh, the minimum investment on, on most syndication deals is 50,000. Some are 100, some are 250. Um, you know, often for 250 or 500,000, you can get better deal terms. And that's one of the major values that, uh, you know, that we add that actually covers a majority of the fees, uh, that we, uh, uh, yeah, that we do charge. So, you know, my, my initial advice is if you only have a few hundred thousand, it really it probably benefits you to start in a fund because you have that diversification. Uh, you have that diversification of geography operators. Um, the expert selection of, of proven operators that, uh, you know, that we've had success with. And, um, you know, one other thing is just the diversification of time. Um, we're, we're doing some analysis on our first fund, uh, right now, which, uh, launched in 2020. And, uh, it was open for, um, you know, about a year and a half, uh, where we were raising capital and deploying, um, across 2020 and 2021, which were phenomenal years. We had, a number of exits. We doubled our money on one. We had a 30, 38 IRR, a 23 IRR. Um, really, you know, exceptionally well on any deal in the first year, year and a half that exited. Um, now with, with rates moving, um, you know, things are extended a little bit. There's, you know, some headwinds. There, there's a few deals that, uh, you know, we may have to inject a little more capital into just because of the higher interest rates. Um, but with that said, when we run our numbers across the, you know, the total of the five years, those initial exits, are, are doing wonders for stabilizing the overall return because we, we made hundreds of thousands of dollars in profit early. And when you calculate your, your internal rate of return, um, the more profits you generate early, the more cash returned early, um, it, 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 it really maximizes and stabilizes your overall return. So, um, the fact that we're able to deploy over that year, year and a half, um, is really a measure of safety. And, and so, so if you're in a fund, that's actually, I think something that's underestimated is uh, the ability to dollar cost average over a period of time. Sure. No, it, it makes a lot of sense, especially given, uh, like you mentioned, the factor of timing is, is huge in this industry where, you know, you don't know if there will be supply chain constraints. You don't know, uh, you know, you can always make projections whether it be around rent growth, around wage growth, you know, uh, the growth of a certain metro area. And sometimes you, you just really don't know. And so it's good to be able to come in, diversify, and, you know, really kind of learn the syndication market without having to put all your eggs in one basket early, right? I, I, I spoke to an investor just a couple of days ago who's still waiting for his first distribution on a new construction deal from several years ago. Great deal, good operator had uh, a few challenges in the supply chain and all of a sudden, you know, that one fifty thousand dollar bet is the only one you have. And so uh, he's actually looking to make the diversified approach for that reason. So, it, yeah, that's, that's another great thing sense. about a fund. Um, you know, we have, um, yeah, we have a few construction projects in our fund, but then we also have project projects that are slow and steady with cash flow. So we have that combination all within one vehicle of some ground up development, but also a lot of, a lot of just stable cash flow and multifamily. Right. So, so Jack, I guess with that in mind, how are you really navigating, uh, balancing the portfolio within JCAM, right? Since, you know, you mentioned we're really a fund of syndications in a lot of ways. Can you talk a little bit about navigating this, uh, you know, challenging times when it comes to balancing cash flow, appreciation, different asset classes? Can you talk a little bit about, you know, how you've been able to, to do it on a, a pretty large scalable level? Sure. Well, I think one of the, the, the best things that, that, that we've built here is that we, we've got really strong deal flow from, from very strong operators. It's very difficult to find a good deal. And, and we've often, you know, I've had people ask, ask me, they're like, how do you find a deal in this market? Whether it was when things were skyrocketing and, and there were multiple offers on deals and, and everyone was having a hard time uh, winning deals to now with higher interest rates and, and, you know, some people on the sidelines. And, uh, you know, for us, as we've built that machine and we have this, you know, history of investments, even well before this fund was a formal fund, it was my personal investment. So we're getting sent perhaps three to five deals a month from proven operators, and we may pick one deal a month. So we have operators looking at maybe a thousand deals or each of them looks at 200. So they're looking at a couple thousand deals and then there might be 60 to 100 deals a year potentially to do with an operator we already like. And we, you know, we may invest in 12 to 15 of them. So we're already seeing the best of the best opportunities. And, um, 
you know, what we choose, uh, you know, depends on timing. It depends on what's already in the portfolio. Um, we've certainly made a bit of a pivot to cash flow and just more conservative leverage and, and deals with positive cash flow. Cause in today's market with today's interest rates, if a deal has positive cash flow currently, you know, if rates do come down, there's a lot of built in upside there just purely on, on rates, uh, you know, stabilizing. Um, yeah, I don't expect them to, and they don't need to go back down to anywhere near where they were in 2020 and 2021. But, uh, you know, even a point drop in the 10 year, for example, could add, um, a couple points to the overall return, uh, just by, you know, lowering interest rate. It'll help on a refinance. It also may help on the cap rate on the sale. So, you know, it's, it's navigating a balance of cash flow, overall return and capital preservation. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, there's an art and a science to it. it really depends on sort of the best opportunity we see available. Um, along with, you know, what else we have in the portfolio, what geographies we're in, how much do we have that's just stable cash? How much do we have that's value add? Um, what do we have, uh, as far as new construction? Um, you know, that generally has the highest overall, uh, return, but, you know, you generally go without cash flow for the first year or two. Right. So uh, can you talk a little bit more than about, uh, a few specific asset classes that you look to? for cash flow versus what asset classes you like to invest in uh, from an appreciation perspective? Sure. Well, uh, you know, I'd say our, our still our core asset class is still multifamily value add, and that provides a combination of cash flow and upside. You know, now during 2021, there was, um, you know, it was such a frothy market that there were some deals that didn't really have any cash flow. And, uh, you know, we, you know, we were generally avoiding those, uh, you know, in certain cases, there were still a deal to that had so much upside, uh, that we, that we went into a value add with minimal cash flow. Um, but, uh, at least in today's market, uh, most deals now are, are conservative leverage, lower loan to value, immediate cash flow, um, still with upside for forcing appreciation through renovating apartments that are severely under market. Uh, we don't, you know, they're not necessarily distressed, but we want those buildings that, either have been owned for a long time by one family and they just weren't being aggressive with their renovations or, you know, in today's market, there are some distressed opportunities where uh, the current ownership just doesn't have the money to pay uh, for uh, a higher interest rate or to pay down the mortgage to uh, you know, support uh, the current uh, higher interest rates. So uh, there are opportunities there. Uh, we also, we, we love light industrial, uh, the buildings that you know, have a number of garages, uh, the type of buildings that like an HVAC contractor or electricians, uh, the, you know, the trades, they need some storage space, a warehouse space, you know, maybe a few desks, but, you know, a, an ability to, to run their business from there. Um, we, we also look at some niche opportunities. Uh, we're in an RV park marina opportunity and we're going to go into the next one as well. Um, the cash on cash return, we're walking in with double digit cash on cash return because, uh, these assets just trade at double the cap rate of what a, uh, you know, typical multifamily would trade, would, uh, would trade. So, um, you know, generally the nichier the asset, the higher, the higher the returns. Um, but, uh, you know, the core is still multifamily, self storage, mobile home parks, which are probably the three most, um, kind of most common syndicated asset classes. Then we round that out with some, uh, ground up development, uh, our RV mobile home park, uh, uh, marinas, student housing, uh, senior housing. And, uh, I don't think, uh, I'm sure I missed something, but, uh, I think I covered most of the basics. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's the thing when, when you've done so many syndications across so many asset classes, uh, you know, there, there are always pros and cons to each one, but like you said, the more niche, the better, uh, often, you know, in, in a market like, like we're seeing today, and that's just not something that the average uh, accredited investor is really able to access, one, from a capital perspective, but also, like you mentioned, the vetting and underwriting process. It, it's it's not always easy to come into a new asset class like, like you said, a marina and RV park or mobile homes or something that uh, the average investor has never never considered or invested in on their own. Yeah, absolutely. I knew I forgot one. That's um in, in today's market, the other one that's really hot right now that we're, we're doing really well with is uh, private lending. Um, the banks have really pulled back. The community banks, the regional banks that used to be uh, the typical lender for, um, you know, some type of fix and flip slash renovations have really, really pulled back. And we're, we're 
we're working with a group and I actually do some consulting and sit on the credit committee that is providing short-term bridge loans with very high interest rates. Their rates are in the 20s, uh, but they can close in seven days. They've got in-house counsel and uh, they're, they're funding deals that are great deals with great sponsors that just don't have 60 to 90 days to go through all the hoops that a, that a bank will, would put them through. And, and because most of the deals, there's just something about it because it's, it requires a, a too much renovation or, or there's something that just doesn't check every box for a traditional bank to lend. And because of that, they don't get that eight to 10% rate. They have to pay double the rate. Um, and, you know, it seems like a very high rate, but when you compare it to the return on an equity investment, um, if we were to invest as a fund, as an equity partner, you know, you know, in a fix and flip type of deal, we're going to want a 20 to 25% return anyway. So what they're able to do is, is structure it as debt and get the similar returns to equity. And in today's market, there's, there's great opportunities to provide high interest rate debt to, uh, you know, those that just don't have other options for credit. And it is a win-win. They get their projects finished. Um, they pay a high interest rate. But for them, for the borrowers, it's cheaper than a business partner. It's cheaper than splitting a deal 50-50. So um, it, mm -hmm. it is a win-win, but it's uh, it's been a great asset class for us. And it's something that we're very bullish on in, in this environment. Sure. So, uh, Jack, for our listeners who maybe aren't familiar with private credit, maybe they haven't invested in, in private lending before, can, can you talk a little bit about, uh, I guess, what a particular deal can look like? Because one thing that I've noticed with private lending especially is that the timelines are a lot shorter. You know, we, we underwrite a lot of deals in, uh, you know, a lot of equity positions when it comes to multifamily, when it comes to industrial, where you might have, you know, five to 10 year hold period. So can you talk a little bit more about, uh, I guess, some of the, the terms that you're seeing in, the, in these private lending deals? Sure. So it's generally six to 12 months maximum, especially when you're paying a higher interest rate. It's generally, it's called a bridge loan. It's, it's meant to be short term duration. Sometimes it may be as low as three months. Um, we, we generally, I think three months is generally the minimum that we would want to get involved in because, you know, there's the amount of time and diligence and closing costs to get a deal done. You don't want to get paid off in two weeks. You know, you want a minimum amount of interest when you, when you put, uh, put money out. But yeah, say call it three to 12 months. And uh, usually there's some type of construction or repositioning happening, whether it's just finishing the flip of a house to uh, mm -hmm. doing some type of ground up construction, uh, occasionally some type of land entitlement, uh, you know, going through, uh, you know, the city planning board for approval or, you know, or in some cases doing, you know, doing some site work, doing some foundation, doing something to the point where you can go to the actual bank and do a more traditional construction loan. Mm -hmm. um, what we've seen a lot of lately are, Deals that other hard money lenders um, are are not advancing either because they are running out of money or they have their own issues. So, um, you know, one of the the best deals that that uh, we're involved in uh, was uh, nine new construction homes, of which um, half of them were already what's called watertight. So roofs, windows, everything was in. They just needed to finish the inside, and the, the current lender just wasn't releasing the money for the construction draws. And because they had their own financial problems. So that was a situation we were able to step in, um, got that old loan paid off. So we're in first position and, uh, you know, had the rest of the money reserved on, on draws for uh, this bill. This is a guy who's been building houses for 30 years. So it's not, this is not something that this is, this is a, an issue across the economy right now with a lot of lenders just being either unwilling to lend or because of their own issues are, are not fulfilling their obligations. So, um, and this deal at this point, almost all the houses are full, are uh, fully, fully done. A few of them are under contract to sell. And it's, uh, you know, a great situation. We were earning a lot of interest, but uh, the actual, uh, you know, borrower um, got out of a real pickle that uh, wasn't, uh, wasn't his fault. Um, you know, right. To begin with, it was just something with the economy. Um, so that deal will be in and out in less than a year, probably make 30% type of return. Um, and that's, that's part of the, one of the lending funds that we're, uh, we're involved with, which, uh, you know, is available on our, uh, platform, our direct deal platform and JCAM investments, uh, dot com. Um, so it is available to accredited investors. Right. No, it, it sounds like a great opportunity. And again, one that uh, most investors just wouldn't even consider when they're, when they're looking to invest in real estate. Uh, a lot of times, unless you're really in the industry working uh, on a daily basis, hours a day, it's not the kind of opportunity that you'll find or even really consider in most cases. So that's 
the, the value of, uh, of diversification and coming in and working with professionals who have worked every angle of the industry, you know, something that, uh, you know, you were doing before investing in syndications, right? Was, uh, it was quite niche as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, 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 the niche opportunities are really where the outsized returns are. And, um, you know, I've, I've heard, I've heard people just, uh, you know, question if it's too good to be true. And it, it just comes down to just market efficiency. Um, you know, I mentioned REITs earlier for, um, you know, the, 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 the non, not, not efficient for tax treatment. But the other thing is the more available, the more public an opportunity is, the lower returns you're going to pay. That's why companies will spend millions of dollars to go public so that they can offer lower dividends. I think the average dividend in the S and P is like 3% or something like that right now. And, yeah. uh, yeah, that's because they're, they're public companies and they have the availability to, to pay the, the really low return and, and use that money for, you know, for investments. Uh, when you have a, a private placement and these deals used to be country club deals that up until about 10 years ago, you could not legally advertise. You could only go to that friends and family or people from your country club. Uh, but since the recent, uh, the law changes in uh, 2012, you know, this is really the first time we're only about 10 years into, um, you know, a time where you can legally promote private uh, investment deals. So I, I really, it's part of my mission is to get the word out and uh, educate people on the availability of these assets, which I, I firmly believe are superior to uh, traditional stock investing. And, and you know, I think everyone um, should have a higher allocation. If you're not at all invested in private deals, you, you shouldn't have 100% of your money just in Vanguard funds and stocks and bonds and all the traditional stuff. I think uh, having a higher exposure is, is important. And it's something that the multimillionaires, people worth 20, 30, 50, $100 million, they have a greater concentration of their wealth in private equity and real estate than those that are the traditional kind of one to $10 million credited investor. Sure. No, it, it makes a lot of sense. So Jack, as we wrap up both the show and also as we wrap up 2023, you know, if you have investors who have decided that real estate is, is where they want to be, it's what they're comfortable with looking to diversify, like you said, a little bit out of stocks, out of uh, out of bonds, out of traditional investments. What are maybe the three biggest pieces of advice you have for an investor looking to really make that final decision between fund, direct, and just how to how to wrap up the year on a, on a high note from an investing perspective? Sure. Well, I think first things first is to you know take stock of your overall financial picture currently. Um, you know, what is your tax rate? Where is your money currently? What is your exposure? Are you ninety percent in the stock market? Are you you know in 70% cash and, and just being eaten away by inflation. Um, you know, number two is to, you know, get as much information as possible. There's tons of content out there. We have tons of content, tons of case studies. Uh, there's a lot of podcasts, a lot of forums. Uh, so there's tons of, of great information out there uh, to give background. And then, uh, you know, I think the last thing is to, you know, to reach out to us. We're, we're very accessible. We, we love to strategize, um, you know, with investors. Um, we ran a dinner last month in New York City to some of my old friends and colleagues in New York, specifically on tax savings. And uh, we're actually going to do a virtual one, um, I believe, uh, November 21st. I don't know. This may. This, November this may 21st. Before. Yeah, we'll, we'll see if this drops before we may have to push this podcast episode up. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, have a conversation with us. We, we love to, to talk through efficiency. There's people that we've saved hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes. Um, through, uh, you know, through investing with us because it could offset some of their other income. Um, it doesn't work for everyone. If you have a high W2 job, you know, there's, there's limitations on, on what real estate can do. But, um, if you have other passive income and investment with us could offset rents from other passive income you have. Um, and we're also, uh, you know, just, we want to talk to your, we're not financial advisors, but, you know, we want to talk about the most efficient way to invest. Uh, we've, we've helped a lot of tired landlords who own a bunch of properties, want to sell, but didn't want to pay the taxes. And, uh, you know, we've, we've made a lot of recommendations on how to do a 1031 exchange to uh, uh, sell a property tax deferred and use that money to invest passively. So um, just just reach out. We're, we're, uh, we, we love to strategize. We'd love to, to hear your story and, and share information and, and see if uh, it would make sense to work together. Yeah, that all sounds great, Jack. I mean, uh, every time we do one of these shows, I, I learn a little bit more. I know our listeners do as well. So 
uh, you know, certainly appreciate the time and, uh, and having you answer all these questions for all the listeners, the Alternative Investor Mastermind. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you so much for popping back on. Um, I would ask everyone to please uh, like and subscribe on uh, on YouTube. Uh, leave us a review on uh, iTunes, Spotify or your platform of choice and uh, you know, connect with us on your social media of choice. We do have an active Facebook group for Alternative Investor Mastermind. There's some great content being posted in there and some great discussions happening. So uh, connect with us uh, however, uh, however you like and uh, we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks, everybody. Excellent. Thank you, Jack. That's all for this episode of Alternative Investor Mastermind. Now that you know the many alternative opportunities out there all up for the taking, you can finally become ultra-connected and ultra-wealthy. Get more valuable advice from the experts by subscribing to the show at alternativeinvestormastermind.com. Become a winner in the world of passive investing today in alternative investment strategies. Thank you for joining us. Until next time.